Existential therapy is loosely based on existentialism, such as the writings of Jean-Paul Sartre and Martin Buber. However, its application as a therapy is actually much more optimistic than the writings of many existentialist authors. Existential therapists believe in the importance of discussing the philosophy of existential therapy and view therapy as a shared journey that examines meaningfulness in life. Thus, it is not unusual for existential therapists to share their knowledge about living and dying and even to periodically self-disclose as they attempt to develop an authentic relationship with their clients. Because existential therapy is based on the sharing of a philosophy, it does not offer specific techniques for doing therapy. However, some argue that sharing a philosophy is a technique in itself. Some of the underlying assumptions of this philosophy include the following the ability to self-reflect and be self-aware. Although individuals often choose a life of denial, they are capable of self-reflection and self-awareness. Feelings as a message of our being in the world, anxiety, guilt, depression, and other feelings are a statement about the choices we make and should be examined in this context, not as an indication of pathology. Choice. We are capable of making positive choices for ourselves and for all of humanity. Not choosing is a choice and can lead to what some have called an existential death or existential vacuum. Responsibility. We have a responsibility to make choices that will positively affect ourselves and others. Otherwise, we all will live in chaos, meaning through our relationships with others. We are constantly redefining ourselves through our relationships. Therapy is a journey through which the therapist and the client are equal partners in their search for meaning. The importance of authenticity. It is critical that we are real with others. Otherwise, we live a life of lies and deceit, a life filled with denial of one's true feelings and inner thoughts a never-ending search for completeness and wholeness. As we become more authentic and more aware, healthy choices become more obvious and easier to make. However, due to the complexities of life, we will be faced with choices, sometimes difficult ones, until we die. Let's see how Dr. Ed Neukrug applies this philosophy with his client, Betty, and their shared existential journey. Well, Betty, I want to thank you for coming in today and agreeing to share some of your thoughts and concerns with me. And I um, want to just kind of open it up, and you can start wherever you like. Well, uh, I just uh, recently retired from the police department, mm -hmm. and I'm moving into a profession now of counseling mm -hmm. uh, where I understand that I will need to have some type of closeness or relationship with my clients, but I really mm -hmm. don't have any that much experience in that uh, regard because of my my work and um, like the only uh, substantial relationship I've had was with my uh, mother. It, it's it's fascinating. I, mean, I find the, I find the contrast between being a police officer and, and a counselor really interesting, and um, especially when you talk about. Um, the, the fact that you, it sounds like you want some intimacy in, in your life, but you haven't really had that except for with your mother. And so the, the, there's a stark contrast there between, again, between being a police officer and being a counselor. It sounds like you, you want to move into that direction of having more intimacy in your life in general. Yes. Um, it's just, I just find it, I find it hard to talk about. Uh, I, um, Which part's hard to talk about? Uh, the intimacy part, and I don't understand how how to work it, how to work it out because there's certain aspects of myself that I just didn't uh, acknowledge. Mm -hmm. I ignored. Mm -hmm. I'd say the emotional part of myself was not honored, and now that I'm stepping out of a role, mm -hmm. which I had a script, 
Right. You know, I, I had the uniform. Right. I knew what I had to do. Mm -hmm. There was no, no question about what I had to do each day. Right. It was like a mantra. It was like something I did mm -hmm. every day. And right. now, it's, yeah. I have to be, I have to come out of myself. Right. It almost sounds robot-like um, that you mm -hmm. kind of lived a role. And in fact, you, you even said it, you wore a uniform and you put a certain image out to the world, an image which was maybe not the real you as you saw yourself inside. And now you're really searching for who that inner being is. Right. More so, uh, also, um, uh, working in an environment that has been historically racist mm. and sexist, yes. um, you tend to want to be invisible. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, when I say you tend, I tend to want mm -hmm. to be invisible right. and not and not be in front so open about who I was. It right. was like I was just following mm -hmm. the role being like the good girl. Right. And my womanhood was not honored. Mm -hmm. It was a minor thing. And it right. was not just, I'm just not talking about the people. I'm talking about with myself. And now okay. it's, it's coming out that that's who I am. Okay, so you found that in that, in that environment of being a police officer, am I correct in, that, in, in hearing that you, you, you personally experienced racism and sexism? Yes. And, and that was very difficult for you and you kind of, kind of hid. Yes. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Um, the way I dealt was that, with that was to, to feel like I had to achieve in order to be accepted. It was conditional. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what else to to say about that. It was it was uh, it was hard lessons. I learned a lot. I also right. had to look at look at how I my role in all of it. Right. You uh, you made some difficult choices, I think, as a police officer in terms of how you were going to live your life because of the sexism and the racism and the just nature of being a police officer, and the choices were. Um, and maybe they weren't even that conscious, but it sounds like the choices were to kind of hide your real self. Well, it wasn't that, like, it, well, that's true. It wasn't conscious. Okay. Uh, I had to come to this point, mm -hmm. reading books and, mm -hmm. and looking at other people to realize how much of myself was unconscious mm -hmm. of what, what I was really doing. It was detrimental to me as, yes. a, as a person and yeah. emotionally. Yeah. So now that I have to work with people in that area. I need to need to know myself and how to be in the world yeah. authentically. Well, I'm, I'm certainly impressed that this is, that you switch roles like that and that this is your, your new goal for yourself. And, um, and I'm really interested in how you were able to, to raise your consciousness around um, your lack of awareness of self and your lack of intimacy and how you were playing roles. How, how did you do that? Well, it, I'd say it happened um, two different ways. Uh, one way was books. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, there was a book I found called Black Feminist Thought. Mm -hmm. and that, that really opened my eyes right. a lot. And also when my mother was sick, I realized I was working mm -hmm. and I realized that the role of caring in the heart is so much more important to mm -hmm. me in this life than, than the uh, I don't know how the other way to put it than a masculine way of being. Okay. Being out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the role of caretaking when my mother was sick was very important. Yeah. I had to like really open up to that, and that right. takes a lot of courage. To yes, it does, and that's. Do and I hear how courageous you were, and I uh, think I'm also hearing that kind of these two parts of yourselves were being opened up at the same time, and that was that feeling mm -hmm. part of yourself th through your mother's illness, and also kind of the intellectual part of yourself through the through this book that you read and, and other books that you read mm -hmm. that, that th both of those kind of raised your consciousness about the importance for you that you found more authenticity in your life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, when you watch someone suffer which is hard I mean with the police work mm -hmm. uh, there was well it was more of a Detached stuff. Detached. Yeah. A pseudo kind of presence, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you 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 knew that you had to uh, bind yourself emotionally to get through it. I it's see. not a bad thing because sometimes mm -hmm. you need to do that, but right. uh, you just don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And when my mother was sick, then I I had to to really look at those feelings right. and try to integrate that that was that was really hard. Right, I'm a lot sure. of anger and all that. Right. So again, your mother Ill your mother's illness really. When it made you look at yourself in, in some deeper ways. Right, right. I had to make decisions. You know, I had to balance work, and uh, I was at the hospital with her mm -hmm. a lot. So I had to balance work and be there mm -hmm. or make the decision to leave work and be there, you know, right. leave. So I had to, it was, it was like, I don't know if this makes any sense, but it's like dealing with my mother and father. Mm -hmm. Like the police department, to me, was like my surrogate father. Okay. Where you were like, not not exactly, I would say, a, a balanced view of a father, but you had to be there, you had to stay strong, you had right. to do your job. And right. with my mom, it was, it was different. I had to be open and receptive right. and... Right. Feeling, like you said, get in touch with the feeling part. Yeah, I think I can really understand what you're saying. I had um, kind of a similar experience with my mom, who was ill a few years ago and mm. uh, passed away. And, and um, I, I had was like I was living two lives in some ways. Right. Is that kind of the experience yeah, that you yeah, had? Yeah, exactly. Living two lives. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess the, um, in, in a way, and, and I hope, hope you understand how I mean this, the gift that your mom gave you in her illness was to help you see a deeper part of yourself. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Because I I did have to uh, walk through that and see. I I mean, I really had to just be there and connect. Yeah, you know, with a deeper part of myself, which wasn't wasn't very easy or pretty. Life is. It wasn't. It was very messy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so now mm. you've chosen a field which is, and maybe this is more of a conscious choice, you've chosen a field which deals mostly with authenticity mm. and mm -hmm. realness, and now you want to move on with your life in a new way, in a way where you have more realness in relationships, <coughs> and more intimacy, um, perhaps in, um, realness in your counseling, counseling relationships, perhaps more realness in your friendship and love relationships, and now you can consciously begin to make choices about bringing yourself to this new place. Is that making sense to you? Yeah, I um, I have to. Well, I I I need to. Let's say I would say honor my emotional life, mm -hmm. which I have not okay. done. It's uh, usually a sign of weakness in my uh, in my way of being in the world before. That was the bef you before, right? And, and now, now we have the new you. The new me. And I, I've got to say, I really respect this new you, uh. as you are honoring yourself, honoring your emotional self, and beginning to listen to it um, more effectively, um, more frequently. Yeah, more frequently. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Well, it sounds like it's been a kind of a hard road for you um, in recent years, but it, I'm also hearing that you're making some really good choices for yourself as you're moving forward in your life. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I really respect that. Well, thank you. It seems like I have to work really, really hard to be... Uh, anything more than ordinary. Hmm. So I just I'll just uh just keep working as long as I don't lose myself in my work. That's a fear too long. <laughs> <laughs> you want to remain real. Right, 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 yeah. right. And right. I guess yeah. I'm thinking that a lot of times we we think that um life is gonna be easy. But uh as you're showing us it usually yeah. isn't. There are there are so many things in life that that give us difficult, hard times, and uh, messages to ourselves about who we are and where we're going. And I think you're really, really hearing some of the messages that you're getting about yourself. 
can you give me something to take with me? <laughs> <laughs> I guess what I'm, uh, what I, I guess what I'm hearing, me. yeah, I guess what I'm hearing, <laughs> that's a great question. I guess what I'm hearing is that you've been giving yourself something. And, oh. and, and if I can give you anything, that's what I want to give you, and that is to continue to give yourself that, that sense of inner awareness that you've, been, you've begun to give to yourself. Thank you for sharing today. Thanks. Well, I enjoyed watching your session on existential counseling just now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to know, as I assume audience was, would want to know, and students, what's unique about existential counseling? Right. Well, when I think of existential counseling or, or therapy, I think of it as um, being in the school of existential and humanistic therapies, much like person-centered and gestalt therapy. Um, but as opposed to those approaches, which I think have kind of a preset way of doing things, um, with existential therapy, you're embodying more of a philosophy. And the philosophy has to do um, with things like having a shared journey with, with okay. the client, thinking about the fact that the client, um, that, that feelings and anxiety in particular are messages to the client about his or her being in the world, mm -hmm. um, looking at the type of types of choices that people are making and how that mm -hmm. helps to define who they are and where they're going in life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have those in the back of my mind um, when I'm doing existential therapy as a way of, again, way of living in the world mm -hmm. um, and not necessarily having any preset techniques. So would you say there's some metaphors that tend to be, or some terms that maybe characterize it? One is a journey mm -hmm. and sharing right. the journey um, on some level with the client right. uh, in a supportive and maybe challenging way. Right. Uh, choices. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, you didn't say this, I'm wondering, taking responsibility for your life right. and those choices. Absolutely. Taking responsibility okay. is, is important. Um, okay. We don't only take responsibility for ourselves, but as we, t as we listen to ourselves and make choices, we're making choices for the whole world. Okay. It, it, and every choice I make affects the world in some mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also thinking, when you mentioned the, the word journey, that um, it is a sh shared journey, and I feel somewhat comfortable sharing parts of myself and some, some of my own journey mm -hmm. in my attempt to help the client understand his or her journey. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned that disclosing some of your, your own uh, life or your own ideas, maybe values, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, would be part of that um, process. What other um, response, counselor responses might be mm -hmm. um, used in existential counseling? Right. But certainly, like in person-centered counseling, you certainly you, you would use a good share of empathy as you attempt to understand the client and help the client um, f um, hear deeper parts of him or herself. Um, you're also going to use questions so you can help um, understand the client and help them broaden their perspective of the world, uh, self-disclosure again. And also, um, I think you help the client, um, you help to point out the types of choices the client has made. So you might ask them about the types of choices and where they where they've gone and where they think they're going in the future. And I noticed you did some instruction. In mm. a certain way, right. Um, right. you might share some perspectives that you introduced to the client mm -hmm. in the process of counseling. Would that be a possibility in existential counseling to tell them mm -hmm. some perspectives to think about? Yeah, many existential therapists would actually kind of share the philosophy of existential therapy with a client. And some, some people even actually might even read some of the philosophy to them. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a kind of a way of understanding how one might live in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in a lot of ways, it has some parallels to what I think of as person-centered mm -hmm. uh, counseling. Can you help me with some of the, e either the similarities and or the distinctions between the two, so right. we can get a handle on that? Right. Well, when I think of person-centered counseling, um, I, I think that the main um, role of the counselor is to be empathic, and that that is the primary responsibility to, to, to show empathy to the client. Um, so empathy is showing the client that you understand what's happening with him or her, and um, that the client hears you in some way. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's about, and empathy is very powerful, mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to minimize it, but that's about the only, I say this loosely, but the only technique you use in, em in person centered counseling. Mm -hmm. You just are showing empathy. Mm -hmm. Empathy can take people to deep levels of self, mm -hmm. um, but you don't tend to use questions. You don't use instruction. You mm -hmm. don't talk about choices. 
you just listen and show the client that you've heard them in deep ways. Yeah. So the humanistic uh, person-centered approach, there's a profound belief that the uh, person is almost like a um, self-discoverer mm, right. um, and it's just waiting to be tapped into. Yes. Whereas the existential counselors would add some instigations of questions, self-disclosure, mm. instruction that would um, help uh, po both of the counselor and client ponder some of the meanings right. uh, that people are making and the responsibilities right. they're taking for those meanings. Right. Excellent. That's an excellent description. Um, I guess I, one other piece that seems important to me, and my last question is, what's the place of the idea of choice mm -hmm. in existential counseling? It right. seems that that is a central issue uh, in, in existential counseling. Mm -hmm. Well, we are constantly making choices for ourselves, and as I think as this client so clearly showed, that sometimes we're aware of the choices we make and sometimes we're not so aware. And she, she has lived a life um, where mostly she wasn't aware of her mm -hmm. choices. Um, and they were kind of slightly out of, just slightly out of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And as a person becomes um, more thoughtful and re self-reflective, they begin to make better choices. And um, I actually like what Carl Rogers said about choice at one point. And he said that um, as people become clearer about themselves and who they are, their choices become clearer, as if they don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. And I, lo I love that remark because you know exactly how you're supposed to act yeah, in yeah. life mm -hmm. or be in life. Yes. yes. And there they join in some ways. Uh, the thing I would also add is taking responsibility for the choice. It sounds like existential philosophy, which is about being in the world um, without expecting somehow to be rescued um, or to be given the answer. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be what existential counseling asks the client to do, but that the counselor is a fellow traveler on right. that journey. Right. And that's why I responded with it to this client the way I did when she asked me to give her something. Mm -hmm. And what could I give her is, is maybe s some um, reinforcement that she needs to give herself mm -hmm. um, more, um, continued awareness of her being. Right. So she will have the choice that is almost feels like it's not a choice right. in the future as she becomes more conscious of her place in the world or the place she wants to make in the mm -hmm. world. Right. Well, good. Well, thank you for that. Um, I appreciate your insights into existential counseling. Well, thank you for your fine uh, comments.